long story but? Long story but. A long story but. Is the long story but. Hello, and welcome back. I hope you've enjoyed season one. Recent events have spurred conversations and space for learning and growth. Black lives matter, and I feel it's my responsibility to speak up and speak out against institutionalized violence and oppression. I'm white, and therefore cannot speak to the experience of black folks or other people of color. But I have been privileged enough to have access to an education that's allowed me time to reflect on issues of equity. As I begin work on season two, I thought I'd share a story that's been the core of my academic work. Some of you may have noticed that many of the folks I talked to were students at the University of Oregon. I finished my PhD there in June 2019, focusing on issues of equity on public lands. So now I'd like to share a story to contribute what I can to this larger dialogue. Long story, but public lands aren't actually public. Trail bros are a thing, and the remnants of the men who came before them. Creating the public land system that we know today, labeled public, but managed for a particular population. You might be asking, what the hell is a trail bro, Nikki? And I'll get there. But first, I think we have to start with a solid foundation. You see, public lands are anything but public. For generations, public lands have been gatekept by the expectations of practice on public lands. Who belongs there and what will they be doing has been shaped by the very people who worked to declare these lands owned by the state, managed by our government, in the name of conservation for future generations. But we have to dig a bit deeper here. Who are these people and what was their vision of the future? I think a recent and relevant example may help to guide this narrative. In the now infamous video, Amy Cooper is seen calling the police on Christian Cooper, an avid bird watcher, a Harvard graduate, a pioneer in comic books, a biomedical editor for health and science communications, and a black man. Unfortunately, the most relevant aspect of his identity, the most obvious to Amy Cooper, was the color of his skin. Amy and Christian were in New York Central Park, the most visited urban park in the United States, a national historic landmark, and a public park. Christian was bird watching. It was Memorial Day. Christian was in a part of the park called the Ramble, where many delicate plants and wildlife live, and he saw a woman walking her dog off leash. Now, I have a lot of opinions about walking your dog off leash. You can't protect your dog or other people from an unpleasant, unwanted, or unnecessary negative experience when you have no control over your pet. You can't protect them from predators or unsafe areas. You can't protect people who may be fearful or allergic. You can't guarantee the safety of your pet or the other people, animals, or terrain. It's irresponsible and unsafe. Not to mention, in most public parks, it's illegal to have your dogs off leash for many of the reasons I've just mentioned. Regardless of my opinion, Amy Cooper was allowing her dog to walk off leash in the ramble, where it was clearly posted that dogs should be on leash at all times. For Christian, who was bird watching, a dog trampling through delicate plant life meant a threat to both those plants and the animals who thrive in them. Many ground-dwelling birds have made those areas their homes, and the intention of requiring dogs to be on leash is to protect that habitat and ecosystem in the park. Amy Cooper claims she was unaware dogs were required to be on leash in this part of the park. Christian told Amy that her dog needed to be on leash, and the two argued about it. He told her, look, if you're going to do what you want, I'm going to do what I want, but you're not going to like it. Amy claimed she felt that was terrifying, as the two were alone in a wooded area. Christian pulled out dog treats that he carries specifically for helping get dogs back to their owners and be put on leash. He said most dog owners hate when a stranger feeds their dog treats, and typically they leash their dog afterward. Amy claims he was throwing them at her dog, and that's when Christian began recording the exchange. Amy immediately tells him to stop recording, pulling at her dog's collar. Christian asks her not to come closer to him as she approaches. She asked him again to stop recording. He asked her to not come closer, 
and she calls the police. She then states, quote, I'm going to tell them there's an African-American man threatening my life. Christian tells her, tell them whatever she would like. She tells the police an African-American man is recording her and threatening her and her dog. She's distraught, and she says she's being threatened by a man in the ramble and asks them to send the cops immediately. Let's stop here. Why was the color of Christian's skin relevant? If it were a white man, would Amy have described him as white or just a man? Why was black the only means of description? She didn't mention his height, weight, clothing, anything that would make him identifiable to the police, except his skin color. Why? Following the event, Amy has apologized to Christian after immense backlash for her actions. It's just one in centuries of accusations against people of color by white folks. Ultimately, what this exchange shows, at its core, is the immensity of white privilege, the toxic and untrue culturally ingrained fear of black folks, and a complete disregard for the validity of either. For the entirety of the existence of the United States, white folks have been privileged. The nation was founded through the process of colonization, arriving to a new land, claiming it despite indigenous populations already thriving on the landscape, and the creation of a system of law and ownership that justifies the accumulation of land, resources, and ultimately capital, the genocide of indigenous populations and black folks forced into the established economy dependent on their labor as property. As the United States became a nation, the foundations on which we now lay our laws, practices, and culture are rooted in a system of white supremacy, of colonization, and of elitism. It's not a pretty picture, but it's a fact that must be acknowledged. For some white people, this is hard to hear and uncomfortable to talk about, but white folks, myself included, must recognize that this nation was built by racist, sexist, and privileged populations. So let's back up. Christian Cooper is a perfect example of the ways that public lands remain policed, both by the institutionalized forces the police that Amy Cooper was calling, and by the individuals who've allowed racist, xenophobic ideologies to seep into their accepted perspective of the truth, like Amy. I have no doubt that Amy Cooper felt threatened. The Me Too movement has illuminated the prevalence of violence against women. But it wasn't that Christian was a man. It's the generations of false narratives of black men committing violence against white women that taught her that Christian Cooper was a threat. What Amy failed to do is recognize her bias, assess the situation without that skewed and inaccurate perspective, and recognize that she was in the wrong. She was the one who was not following the law. She was the one willfully putting others in danger and she needed to alter her behavior rather than reacting based on her implicit bias. The ideas that she brought to that moment instead of the lived reality that they were both experiencing. This incident is benign in the bigger picture. The nation is actively battling the systemic and institutionalized murder of people of color across the nation. I am by no means an expert on the politics of the Black Lives Matter movement or the institutionalized racism in our police forces, and I do not have a simple answer to this violent and heartbreaking reality. But I do know a lot about the founding, development, and management of public lands. My dissertation explores the tendrils of the American public land system and the ways that race, class, and gender affect access to and the experience of public lands in the United States. What I can offer is insight into the way public lands, specifically, were developed through the lens of eugenics, genocide, Christianity, white supremacy, and the newly formed romantic notions of American identity. And with those foundational points, I can tell you what the hell a trail bro is. Let me first set the stage. In the decades following colonization and the American Revolution, populations expanded, filling the once small colonies and creating a more dynamic and populated nation. 
Some mark the Louisiana Purchase in 1803 as a critical moment in American history, when Manifest Destiny, or the idea that one day the United States would reach from one sea to the other, would push populations to the West, advancing the expansion of the world's greatest country and asserting dominance over indigenous populations, articulating their strength and power to their former nation, England. American culture is strange. Developed in opposition to another culture rather than organically, much of what it means to be an American can be traced back to this moment, the aspects of the colonizer's survival being magnified and then exaggerated. Lewis and Clark explored the West, and reports of stunning landscapes, indigenous populations, and wild beasts began to trickle back. People became fascinated with the great, vast lands westward. This was unique to the new nation. Most in England, and most of Western Europe, saw the woods as a place to be fearful of. It was filled with wild beasts and the unknown. But Americans found their ability to explore and survive these landscapes made them not only the polar opposite of their former nation, but asserted their individualism and exceptionalism, tenets that remain a critical aspect of our identity today. A quick and important note, there will be a few of these throughout the episode. Colonies such as Jamestown and Plymouth could not have survived without the help and knowledge shared by indigenous peoples. It's often forgotten by those writing American history. The landscape of North America remains a huge part of how we understand ourselves. The vastness of the United States means varied and diverse ecosystems. People living across the nation experience the seasons very differently. Their landscapes look drastically different from other parts of the same country. People were intoxicated with the idea of adventure and looked westward for new opportunities. Many hoped to claim land through the Homesteading Act, and assert their own independence in the Wild West. It was this exploration and settlement that led to the frontier myth, a belief that there was not enough land in the West for the populations moving there, that at some point the West would be so populated there would be no more space, wild, unclaimed, and the country developed on the premise of wild and tenacious spirit reflected through its landscape, the things that made the nation exceptional, would be lost the frontier would be closed. That fear pushed people to see value in protecting landscapes. And I think it's easiest to start with the two men who are most cited as outdoor heroes. Men who fought voraciously to protect and defend some of the most beautiful landscapes in North America. John Muir and President Theodore Roosevelt. One thing I think that we need to realize, something I want to make really clear, Public lands were intentionally made to not be public. Public meant something different then than it does today. When Muir and Roosevelt were advocating for the protection of the landscape from development, it was while forcibly removing indigenous North Americans from their homelands. They were actively denying that white folks and people of color were the same species, with the same capabilities. These men were men of their time, It's not an excuse, but a layer of context that's often lost as we celebrate them and their accomplishments. Something I think is so critical when celebrating an accomplishment. Ask two questions. Whose voices were part of this process in decision-making, in framing, in writing? And second, who benefits from this accomplishment? And in turn, who doesn't? With that perspective, let's talk about John Muir. Full disclosure, I used to adore John Muir. I'm a lower middle class white person. I grew up in a home that valued the outdoors and John Muir's vibe was enticing. He wrote poetic prose of the outdoors, romanticized his beloved Yosemite, so much so that some say it was his greatest love in life. He preached the importance of observing nature, mirroring its calm and beauty, and building your soul stronger through time spent outdoors. This dude threw a wool blanket, a loaf of bread, and a block of cheese in a bag and spent weeks outside, writing and reflecting. It was his love of Yosemite that motivated him to start the Sierra Club, the self-proclaimed, quote, 
most enduring and influential grassroots environmental organization in the United States. It was with the Sierra Club and his popularity as an author, he wrote many books filled with that same poetic perspective on nature, that he was able to build a platform from which to sell his ideology. Muir was a staunch preservationist, meaning he wanted to leave things exactly as they were. He felt extraction for any reason, of any resource, was wrong and harmful. So from Muir's perspective, building dams, cutting timber, or collecting other forest products was a no-go. Muir was also a strong proponent of something that still infects our perspective today, a separation of humans from nature. Muir once complained about the, quote, dirty and irregular life of the native peoples in the Merced River Valley in his beloved Yosemite. In one of his famous essay collections, Our National Parks, he assured readers, quote, as to Indians, most of them are dead or civilized into useless innocence. This is part of a much larger conversation, perhaps for an episode in the future, but the history of the indigenous populations in North America is one filled with violence, genocide, removal, forced assimilation, and erasure. What Muir is saying here is that national parks are safe because the, quote, savages, as they were so often referred to, had already been killed as Americans moved west or were forced to assimilate to white culture, rejecting their own culture, language, homelands, and ways of life. John Muir was a racist. With this perspective, he fought to protect landscapes, free of other people, pure in the most eugenic sense. Eugenics was a huge part of the development of the American public land system. For those who don't know, eugenics is a pseudoscience that believed in developing the strongest and most pure race by arranging reproduction amongst populations with the most desirable traits. Eugenicists believed that white populations were the most desirable and strong. The most famous example of eugenics is Nazi Germany, though it's important to know that eugenics was prominent in the United States and has run parallel to many environmental movements. Frequently, the phrase survival of the fittest is misappropriated to discuss overpopulation and the use of eugenics in solving global environmental issues. But it wasn't just Muir. Theodore Roosevelt, too, was a huge proponent of public lands, and he, too, had misguided beliefs. Roosevelt alone protected 230 million acres of land. He established the United States Forest Service in 1905 and designated 150 national forests. He designated five national parks while in office, including Crater Lake, Wind Cave, and Mesa Verde. He passed the Antiquities Act of 1906, which grants the President of the United States the ability to declare national monuments from federal lands to protect lands of natural, cultural, or scientific importance, and established the first national monument, Devil's Tower, on September 24, 1906. He also protected 51 bird reserves and four game preserves. He used executive orders to protect forest and wildlife so frequently that by the end of his second presidential term, he'd protected 150 million acres on executive orders alone. Prior to Roosevelt, no president had issued more than 253 executive orders. In all, presidents prior to Roosevelt had issued 1,262 executive orders. That's collectively. Roosevelt himself issued 1,081. But an important and often unrecognized aspect of good old Teddy was his perspective on manliness and the outdoors. Roosevelt preached the tenets of a strenuous life. On April 10, 1899, Roosevelt gave his speech entitled The Strenuous Life. Based on his personal experiences, the, at the time, New York governor began, quote, I wish to preach not the doctrine of ignoble ease, but the doctrine of the strenuous life, the life of toil and effort, of labor and strife to preach that highest form of success which comes not to the man who desires mere easy peace, but to the man who does not shrink from danger, from hardship, 
or from bitter toil, and who out of these wins the splendid ultimate triumph. He spoke to his belief that the individual should work in strenuous ways, and those who don't engage in manual labor should devote themselves to the arts or sciences to better expand our understandings of the world. He asserted that those who do not live a strenuous life do not live meaningful lives. He also explained that it's the duty of every good American to live a strenuous life, to benefit the entire nation. He advocates for imperialism as an extension of the strenuous life, and for a strong military and military presence. His speech was based on his personal experience as a young, sickly boy. He was often on bed rest for asthma, leading to weakness and bullying by other boys. His father encouraged young Roosevelt to take up physical exercise, including boxing, to ward off bullies. This was instrumental in Roosevelt's life. Despite being diagnosed with a serious heart condition, Roosevelt became incredibly active, playing tennis, boxing, rowing, playing polo, hiking, and horseback riding. He found that in his manly pursuits, he was stronger and more capable, living a life more rewarding and, in his mind, more admirable. His speech was moving to many, reflecting the American spirit at the turn of the 20th century, as industrialization and urbanization continued to increase, and many Americans feared the ease of industrialized production and urban living would feminize the nation, making the country soft and weak as individuals lost the rugged tenacity needed to live a self-sufficient life in more rural and wild spaces. American culture gripped tightly to masculinity and nationalism. Writing the American cultural view of patriotism and guiding both Roosevelt's speech and the consequential cultural trends of American individualism rooted in strength, dominance, and imperialism. In his speech, Roosevelt describes what makes the United States great. Generations of men whose fathers before them worked hard with good purpose, and that health can only exist when men and women lead, quote, clean, vigorous, healthy lives. He also suggests a gender dichotomy, identifying men's work as the righteous war and women's work as motherhood. Roosevelt's love of wild lands and his belief in conquest, colonization, and exploration is clear, and the speech remains filled with the tenets of white supremacy and male dominance. A man of his time, just as Muir, Roosevelt combined his Victorian ideas of morality and purity with his love of a concept called the frontier life. The stereotypical image of the American West during Manifest Destiny and other westward expansion, a life lived dirty, wild, and rough. Though his privileged position as not only a well-liked politician, but also a member of a prestigious and privileged family, Roosevelt was able to incorporate his ideals into his political agenda, while enforcing racial violence and warfare. His work connecting moral purity through his idealized, strenuous life and his political portfolio and action asserted him as a chief promoter of manhood and what we might identify today as toxic masculinity, asserting that men should be aggressive, tough, rugged, strong, emotionless. Roosevelt was unique in his intersection of Victorian upper-class bourgeois civility and his admiration and participation in frontier aggression. Roosevelt was a decorated game hunter and in his young life spent time exploring the West, living that frontier life, the same kind he advocated for while back in his privileged political position. Roosevelt was raised in the ideals of strength, altruism, self-restraint, and chastity, which were deeply ingrained in upper-class high-society life, as the Roosevelts were a part of. But Roosevelt also grew up in a time when Western exploration created a genre of American art and literature. It's no shock that sickly Roosevelt lived vicariously through the writings of white men, romanticizing white heroes, achieving their manhood in battle and conquest in the American frontier. In particular, Maine Reed was one of Roosevelt's favorites. Reed's work often depicted young boys exploring masculinity through violence and conquest of native peoples, landscapes, and animal populations. These themes also carried through in the narratives of figures such as Davy Crockett and Daniel Boone, the two figures that Roosevelt would later use as namesakes for his conservation organization. 
the Boone and Crockett Club. What's often overlooked about Roosevelt and his public lands advocacy is his personal and political ideological motivation. His perspective was one deeply seated in intersections of racial superiority and aggressive masculinity. Racial ideas rooted in the principles of the eugenic perspective of racial dominance and superiority are intricately tied. Here's where Muir and Roosevelt begin to overlap. The idealized perspective of nature as pure and innately perfect, perpetuated by Muir, reinforces ideas of nature as supreme in enacting strength and dominance. Again, think the misarticulated Darwinian principle of survival of the fittest. While this is true of natural selection, in applying this to human populations, the context of sexual selection and sociocultural effects are missing. How can one assert that one individual is stronger or more able than another in the natural world without articulating the social, political, and economic impact of human-created systems, such as institutions, like economies, laws, and sociocultural ideals? Ultimately, survival of the fittest, as articulated by Darwin, is not intended or applicable to the human population. A brief note on race. Race as a concept was created by the discipline of anthropology, literally made up. During the Enlightenment era and scientific revolution, people began to prioritize rational, logical inquiry. And during that time, the notion of labeling, cataloging, or describing the natural world became heightened. In an effort to remain relevant, anthropologists began to categorize societies, utilizing what was called the organismic analogy. Armchair philosophers begin to engage with diverse cultures, typically through the notes of missionaries who are colonizing them. And anthropologists jump at the opportunity to create a hierarchy to explain the difference among populations. Edward Burnett Tyler developed the concept of cultural evolution, the theory that supported the notion of unilinear evolution, or a spectrum moving in a single direction towards civility. The idea being that all societies would ultimately end up civilized. Some had just not yet reached that level of evolution. Lewis Henry Morgan created three tiers, savagery, barbarism, and civilization. Through this lens, it was thought that white society must be the most advanced, as populations that fit into the standards of civility were white European cultures. Thus, white people must be the smartest, most adapted, and strongest race of people. The diversity of cultural ideas and practices was compared, always, to the standard of white European culture. Soon, any culture that was seen as not civilized was deemed savages or barbarians. This furthered ideas of racial differences. Pseudoscience was then conducted to intentionally substantiate claims of racial differences being differences in biology. It was claimed that civilized populations were superior and ultimately different from other populations, with larger brain sizes and more adapted features. This remained a prominent belief and practice until the first American anthropologist, Franz Boas, introduced the idea of cultural relativity. That all cultures are unique and cannot be compared, but only understood through the particular lens of that culture. He also advocated for holistic study, and refuted research that asserted racial differences among cranial size. The samples used were often from different age groups, sexes, and ignored or discounted sociocultural factors, such as nutrition, employment, and individual health factors. I want to make clear, race is a made-up concept, developed and implemented to justify violence, oppression, and genocide. However, race is a lived reality for all people every day. Race, a made-up concept, grants white folks privilege. It has real, physical, biological, social, economic, political, and cultural consequences each and every day. Race is a concept developed from biased ideas of human differences, in misarticulated systems, and with a motivation to dominate, colonize, and exploit the people, resources, and cultures of others. This is an important fact that must be acknowledged. In terms of public lands and our two big hitters, John Muir and Theodore Roosevelt, the ideology of racial supremacy was central to their view of the world. Both men were outwardly clear in their goals, highlighting, protecting, and admiring natural beauty through the creation of federal protections of these lands, separating humans from landscapes, 
ensuring removal of indigenous populations, asserting a single view of what outdoor activity should be, and assuring these public lands were managed within that framework. For example, in a clear and tangible way, the first leader of the United States Forest Service, Gifford Pinchot, was a staunch eugenicist. Theodore Roosevelt appointed a man who believed in racial purity and superiority of white folks, advocating selective breeding and forced sterilization. Make no mistake, eugenics asserts that those who have mental or physical disabilities are neurologically diverse, score low on intelligence tests, and don't get me started on how bullshit intelligence tests are because that could be its own episode. Criminals, social deviants, a term which included those who were queer or members of disfavored minority groups, should be forcibly sterilized, disallowed from having children or marrying, and in some extreme cases, such as the practice in Nazi Germany, killed. What's critical to see here is that eugenics is scientific racism, based in a model of white supremacy, literally. White folks are no more fit as a race than other races to survive outside of the cultural institutions built to justify and protect their power. We are a single species. The differences we see in biology are environmentally based, due to social limitations that have advantaged some while oppressing others. Environmentalism has been littered with the tenets of eugenics for decades, and truly it began with the push for federally protected lands, a movement headed by Muir and followed through by Roosevelt. Thus, it was their idea of what one should do in the outdoors, how landscape could and should be utilized, what resource extraction should be, how individuals should and would relate to these spaces that were normalized and became fact and law. While there have been many changes in land management over decades, those changes are happening through the same lens with which political leaders and the public were seeing the issue when Muir professed his undying love for Yosemite Valley and Roosevelt protected more acres of land than any other individual. What we've learned about having a relationship with the outdoors comes from what these men decided we could and should do there. Recreation was developed in response to Roosevelt's strenuous life and Muir's commitment to purify one's soul outdoors. Recreation is a colonial practice, enacting American identity. Our American identity was built on tenets of white supremacy, colonization, and toxic masculinity that continue to infiltrate our perception of normalcy. So back to the top. What the hell is a trail bro? Well, trail bros are exactly what they sound like. The bro type folks who find their validation in the outdoors. These people are privileged, condescending, and arrogant. They aren't always men. Their race and other identities are not static. Anyone can be a trail bro. But it's usually the same demographics as other bros. White men, 16 to 40, privileged in many economic, political, and social ways. These folks are the ones who ask questions like, are you sure you can do that? Who assert things like, you won't get that far. Or strike fear in subtle ways like saying, are you prepared for that? Or in not so subtle ways like telling people outright that they don't belong or shouldn't be on public lands. The thing is, as I've said before, public lands is a huge misnomer for lands that are managed by federal, state, and local governments. The reality is, these lands were stolen from indigenous populations, colonized by white settlers, and what's critical and often forgotten, the politics of these landscapes, meaning the ways that we can or cannot connect to them, was born of a white, male, Christian perspective. Now, I'm not here to say that this is the fault of white Christian men, but what I do want to make clear is that public lands are sold as public, available to all, and preserved for future generations. But the agencies, organizations, and policies used to manage these lands are biased to a single perspective, born of John Muir, Theodore Roosevelt, Gifford Pinchot, and many others like them. Recreation is a colonial practice. I'm not going to say that that's bad. It's just a reality. People who recreate are rarely considering the context in which they came to know what recreation was or how they continue to practice it. In terms of trail bros, they're born of a particular type of recreation, long-distance hiking. Now, you may have heard long-distance hiking referred to in other ways, backpacking or through-hiking, 
And that's a perfect place to start engaging with what it means to be a trail bro, how to recognize one and what their actions mean. I use the term long distance hiking to refer to backpacking, hiking with all required gear on your back for long distance, often on long trails. I use long distance hiking rather than through hiking purposefully to be inclusive of all backpacking happening over long distances because through hiking is a term that's policed heavily by these trail bros. Through hiking is the action of completing a long trail, typically a national trail like the Pacific Crest Trail in the West, the Continental Divide Trail over the Rockies, or the Appalachian Trail in the East, though there are many more trails now across the United States and in many other countries. These trails are frequently thousands of miles long, and to have completed a through hike, one must hike each step of the trail without leaving it due to injury, illness, or other factors. They must hike the trail proper, meaning they can't reroute or be rerouted due to trail obstruction, fire, or other hazards. These trips are incredibly difficult to complete in one straight go without having some type of uncontrollable challenges that might require flexibility of execution. However, if you hike 2,650 miles of the 2,653 mile Pacific Crest Trail, trail bros will say you didn't through hike it. And herein lies the problem. Trail bros decide arbitrarily what is and isn't okay. They've created rules and policies deciding and policing through hiking as if it were a sport, an Olympic sport at that, where each record is constantly challenged, where those who have hiked the most miles are the most talented, accomplished, and worthy, while ignoring or denying the various levels of privilege needed to complete such a feat. Most people think of hiking, backpacking, or long distance hiking as a cheap vacation, and to some it might be. But when I was completing a long distance hike for my research, I was a broke grad student. My monthly stipend for teaching was little more than my monthly rent. I was working two to three jobs at all times, and it was only because I was able to save money through the school year working multiple jobs that I was able to take more than a month to go walk in the woods. I bought all my gear on clearance or heavy discount at REI on credit. Because I bought everything that no one else wanted, it was heavy, cumbersome, and inefficient. I wrote many applications for grants. Most were denied because agencies didn't see how giving me the money to hike was necessary, since anyone can go hike for free. Despite outlining the details of my funding needs, travel to and from the trail, gear necessary to complete the hike, and the permit necessary to sleep in these managed areas— I was denied time and again, because even though my budget was about $10,000, like any other application, they felt that the $10,000 to be used for genetics testing was more valid or necessary. On my hike, I was to complete a 220-ish mile trail over the course of 24 days. It was what felt reasonable for my budget and my ability to take time from working to bring in some kind of income. Various things happened early and late in my hike. Heavy and cumbersome packs, exhaustion, fires, a record snow pack, and later constant lightning storms that nearly killed me and my hiking pals. And that too is another episode. All of these considerations were part of our planning, but we recognized that they were also out of our control. Ultimately, we skipped about 20 miles of the trail and decided to end the hike within 15 miles of the end. We couldn't keep going. We valued our lives more than we valued the prestige of the title through hiker. Of course, hiking almost 190 miles wasn't meaningless to us. We'd done what we intended. It was a valuable experience as a researcher, and more valuable as an individual. And I won't lie and say that there weren't moments when the words of John Muir and Theodore Roosevelt rung true. I felt much stronger and more capable while sleeping on the ground and living with nearly nothing. I did feel connected to the natural world and learn many things but I'm white. I'm the kind of person they were intending to use these spaces, to have these experiences. And I also did so on my own terms. When asked about hiking alone, we always responded, yeah, we left the boys alone. More than once, men responded with aggression. One man even grew so frustrated that he demanded his female partner continue hiking after we had shared that we left our male partners behind. Other men told us it was foolish to take precautions crossing rivers that were bloated with snow runoff and rushing to a waterfall just below the crossing. 
One man laughed at me as I shared that there was a lot of snow on the pass that he was approaching as we had just come down it and struggled to maintain our footing. Yeah, really? He scoffed. I was warning him because there was a raging river covered with an ice bridge, which at this late point in the season would likely break if stepped on, but covered with so much snow, it was impossible to see where the trail ended and it began, and from his angle, he wouldn't have known, but my help was refused. Though the worst of the trail bro offenders was a PCT through hiker, a man who rambled on for hours, loudly, about his pack weight being next to nothing his experiences being better than anyone else's, his knowledge of the trail being superior, and best of all, telling hikers, most of whom were hiking this 220-mile trail, that the first 200 miles are the worst. Why hike if you're only doing 200 miles? His arrogance and condescension didn't stop there. We sat quietly while another PCT through hiker one who would not complete a true thru-hike as she had been turned around at the California-Oregon state line due to fires, began to chat with him. He asserted that she wasn't thru-hiking anymore, and as she attempted to be friendly and engage him in a conversation about the beauty of the trail and her favorite places, he began to turn the conversation into a competition. If she had said a lake was beautiful, well, no, this other one he saw on another long trail was better. He bragged about his all-time mileage, I've forgotten it because I don't care. We met many people on trail. Most were absolutely lovely. People from all over the world, different backgrounds, different goals. The few that we met that were hostile, all white men between 25 and 40, were often the ones that we remembered over the course of the days, hoping that we wouldn't see them again. And the PCT guy, he was the worst. That was just our experience on the one trail. More often than not, it's the people online that are the most offensive. Recreation, as I've explained, is a huge aspect of American culture. We're told frequently that public lands are ours, and truly, it's important that people feel a connection to, or a value of these natural landscapes, to continue to advocate for protecting them as the climate crisis grows more intense. But for those who are new to recreation, or more extreme or skilled activities such as long-distance hiking, Online forums that are intended to be places for questions to be asked, information shared, or community support are toxic breeding grounds for policing of these long trails and hiking. People asking questions about permitting, resources, what to bring, what to eat, how to go about planning, are often shut down and bullied. These trail bros, really trail trolls, reject newcomers and police the trails as if they're their own. Ultimately, they do feel that they are their own. Their unique set of privileges have afforded them the knowledge and experience to be able to do these hikes. And with that, they dismiss anyone else who's trying to gain the experience. Trails are too crowded. All the weekend hikers, all these fake hikers, people are ruining wild spaces, are frequently shared. What we must recognize here is that the ideals presented by Muran Roosevelt about individualism, wild space being pure or free of people, and the separation of humanity from nature has caused a particular perspective on what to expect outdoors. Who should be there? Well, no one, or if someone, a white man. And then how to act in the outdoors. We can't forget that not long ago, black folks could not go to public lands. Signs reading whites only were posted at the gates. I really suggest reading the profound work of Carolyn Finney that provides insight into the black outdoor experience. We have to recognize that what for some has been generational knowledge passed down through family is not universal. Not everyone has the same knowledge, access, or experience. There are some simple things that everyone should know about going outdoors. It can be dangerous, so take the time to learn about what hazards there might be, animals, injury, weather, and what to do if you encounter them. Of course, when people ask online, they're often turned away or rejected as being a newbie and therefore not valid to these trail bros. Similarly, leave no trace ethics are important, but are not widely taught. That's not the fault of these new or less experienced hikers. If someone asks a question with the best of intentions, wanting to learn what the right thing to do is, they're dismissed as stupid or unworthy of these landscapes. And when mistakes are made, rather than calling people in, 
asking questions about why people might do things like leave toilet paper behind, not pack out their trash, or walk in a meadow. People call them out. Cancel culture is toxic. It doesn't allow for a conversation or a dialogue about what happened and why a person's perspective might be off. Calling someone into a conversation is productive. Online bullying justifying the perspective of ownership is not. And what this really comes down to is ownership. These trail bros feel that this is their land. They're kind of right. It's public, and they are part of that public. However, it's also the land of the newbies in these online groups, the people who are not interested in recreating, the people who have called these places homelands for generations before colonization. These lands are for all American citizens, and we must acknowledge that these lands are protected as a result of the colonization of North America, violence inflicted on non-white populations, and the creation and investment in political systems that ensure those powers stay in power. It's not the dominant voice, the loudest voice that we should listen to, but the collective voices of our diverse publics. So when trail bros decide to police these lands and assert their dominance, it's because they've crafted recreation in the image of Muir and Roosevelt's perspectives. It's because Roosevelt espoused a brand of toxic masculinity that connected their value as individuals and their contribution to society to living this rugged life. And Muir, who asserted that these spaces were pure, and it was our responsibility to keep them as such. And the fear that the frontier is really closing, that these spaces will too be lost. But I'm more worried that if we continue to police these spaces, making them exclusive to the privileged few, people won't care about them. These public lands will not be relevant. And as climate change continues to impact our lives, people will begin to shift to survival. Why protect a landscape that others get to play in that doesn't serve you? Why invest in the protection of parks that you never felt safe in or welcome? I believe deeply in the accessibility, representation, and equity of public lands. And across this nation, I refuse to dismiss a newbie or troll folks who are simply trying to learn. I believe in educating yourself to protect yourself in wild landscapes, because they are dangerous. But I also believe that public education should include tenets of leave no trace and personal safety outside. I think there's something to be said about knowledge of public lands, both their origins and their modern iterations. I think there's value in bringing people to landscapes, to connect and learn about the environments that sustain us, the ecosystems of which we are a part. It's critical that we acknowledge the United States is stolen land, colonized by white settlers. We must say out loud that systems of oppression were institutionalized into laws that today remain in place, that discriminate and inflict violence on individuals across the country every day. It's so important that we start each conversation with this knowledge and context. So let's turn again to Amy Cooper, calling the police on Christian Cooper because he asked her to leash her dog. What I want to challenge you to do is put yourself in the same position. Think about what implicit biases you may hold. Amy Cooper acted out of fear. I am in no way defending her actions, but we have to recognize that her perspective was one built through generations of cultural ideas and social institutions that reinforced her actions. It's our responsibility to recognize our own privilege. For Amy, it was her whiteness. For others, it may be their physical ability, their age, gender identity, sexual orientation, ethnicity, nationality, class status, employment status. Privilege comes in many different forms, and the intersections of these aspects of our identity allow us access to different parts of society. What Amy Cooper did was act on fear, rooted in institutionalized racism. What she failed to do was learn what her unconscious biases were. She failed to grow as a person by listening to others and evaluating herself. There are resources online and linked in the show notes for this episode to implicit bias tests you can take, books to read, and other resources to learn and grow. It's not the responsibility of the people being discriminated against or oppressed systematically 
to educate their oppressors or allies. To be a good ally, one must listen and learn, take initiative and promote the voices of others. Right now, the best thing you can do is take the time to explore the immense amount of resources being created and shared. Invest in the work of organizations who support the dismantling of these oppressive institutions. Support business, art, and media produced by diverse peoples. Right now, saying the words Black Lives Matter is important. Speak these words intentionally, then act to support the statement. There's this Venn diagram that I've seen and shared on social media. One circle says, what breaks your heart most about this world? And the other circle reads, your unique talents, skills, and gifts. And where they overlap, where you are now being called to be in service. What I aim to do in this episode is share the knowledge I've been privileged enough to have access to and utilize this platform and your support to engage you all in this conversation. Activism can be diverse. Activism does not require marching in streets. It can be and should be that middle part of the Venn diagram. What skills do you have? What are you best at? How can you turn that into a contribution to true justice? Read. Listen, donate, organize, share, support, teach. White folks, myself included, we need to accept that these conversations are uncomfortable. Take the time and space to learn. As a white person, you'll never know or understand what it's like to be a black person. But it is also not the responsibility of black folks to educate you. Seek knowledge from resources made public on social media, in books, podcasts, webinars, TED Talks, poems, novels, music. I hope you found value in this episode and can take something away that's actionable. Thank you for listening. I really appreciate it. I'm working on planning season two, and I hope to continue to include work done on issues of representation, inclusion, equity, and justice. If you have a story that you'd like to tell or a theme that you'd like me to work on, please reach out to me on social media or email me at longstorypod at gmail.com. Don't forget to check the show notes for resources and please take action in whatever means you can. This is really important. Until next time.